You are probably thinking that talking about oil wouldn't be a very interesting topic, but it is in fact a hot topic, pun intended. So stick around to the end as Larry is about to school you on some rather technical facts you probably have never heard or thought of. All right, Oshkosh 2023 inside the hangar for once now, hangar B actually, and checking out Lab One Inc. to talk about oil, oil filters, and the testing process. So I'm going to introduce uh, Larry. Larry, tell us where you're from and what you're doing. So I'm a serial Zenith builder, but I'm from Phoenix, Arizona originally. Live in Yuma, Arizona now. Um, you guys probably see me fly my Zenith around, but I've uh, been in the oil analysis now for a little over 10 years. And I've been really just involved in all kinds of different aspects of uh, oil analysis from military application to general aviation and all everywhere in between. So, you know, engines are a big topic amongst uh, home builders and uh, airplane owners in general. Um, but I want to go into a little bit more of a, a deeper dive into the maintenance side of things. And oil is a big deal. Um, and also oil tells you things. Yes, so let's first talk about oil and the proper oils for our engines and what you know about that. Okay, so to start off, the reason why we don't use automotive oils generally is they're not compatible with 100 low lead. Um, generally speaking, about the only ones you're gonna see are compatible with 100 low lead are gonna be your diesel oils. So think about like Rotality, stuff like that. And those are good for guys that are using direct drive, air-cooled motors, so that's, that's part of it. When you talk about um, different types of oils, so we have synthetic oils, petroleum-based oils, with the petroleum oils, one of the advantages to them is they hold particles in suspension. So because they're holding things in suspension, instead of dropping all that junk in the in a sump where it's going to be picked up and recycled, petroleum oils tend to deposit all of that stuff directly into the oil filter itself. The advantage of the synthetic oils is that they're better at dissipating heat or handling high heat applications. So one of the best things you're doing if you're not using an aviation specific oil, but you're looking more towards an automotive oil is using a partial synthetic blend because it's giving you the ability to hold all that stuff in suspension and not drop all the stuff in the sump. So compatibility between, you know, all of the things you're running. So guys running, uh, let's just say hundred under, uh, unleaded fuels, things like that. They need to be looking at like a partial synthetic or a uh, multi and definitely multi-grade type of oils. Um, another thing about aviation oils that's a little bit different, uh, especially type of like Aeroshell 100, Phillips 20, W50. None of those oils come from the factory with anti-wear properties added to them. When we look at automotive oils, we have zinc in the form of ZDDP and some other things. Let me stop you there yeah. one second. So, yes. uh, uh, anti-wear, I'm thinking that, you know, it's oil, that's supposed to be a surface built between two metal surfaces, so you're not ever touching. So, how do you add an anti-wear to something that isn't supposed to be touching or wearing? Okay. So. ZDDP is a compound that was developed and what it becomes is a sacrificial metal surface that's a compound within the oil. So as these things are rotating back and forth, it lays down this layer of zinc and instead of any incidental wear that occurs, instead of it happening on your part, it actually happens within that zinc layer. Okay, so within the oil, you're, you have a product or a material that's building up the surface so it can be worn down in the event of a dry start or something like that. Correct. And so, but a lot of the aviation oils, and actually like Phillips, Aeroshell, they don't have any of that in there. So I recommend to everybody, um, whether they're certified, non-certified, to look at something like CamGuard or one of these other anti-wear products, because that's gonna provide them that extra protection inside the motor oil on top of just the, uh, you know, doing the frequent oil changes like we do in aviation. Okay, all right, so that's uh, the oil side of things. For, for the step of uh, actually doing the maintenance on it, and it's wise to get, um, the particles or particulate out of your filter and kind of create a baseline so you know the health of your engine, what's the process for that? Okay, so the thing that we do is we don't need you guys to send in the filters. What we want you to do is take the filter, cut it, and then take pictures of them. So you have that kind of visual trend history right in front of you because you're the first look at that thing. If you ship it to us, things are going to fall out, they're going to get mixed, they're not, it's not going to be coming to us the way you saw it on the bench. So from our perspective, the best thing you can do for your own initial trend is to look at that and look for large material particles. If you see any, indicate to the lab that you saw these particles and maybe even include them in a little baggie in the kit because there's some analysis we can do on those particles that determine the type of metals that they are. But that's not your primary investigation. No, that's not, that is not the primary investigation. The primary investigation is going to be your wear metal analysis. So in wear metals, we're looking at a whole series of metals. So that's iron, aluminum, chromium, copper, and down the line. 
filter. And you get that specifically and straight from the oil, not from the filter. That's correct. We get that directly from the oil. Um, and what we're looking for is the relationship and the trend. And the trend is actually the most important part of this. So when we look at something like a Lycoming, uh, say 0360, 235, doesn't matter within the Lycoming, but at these smaller brands, you typically want to see about 2.2 to 2.4 parts per million of iron generated per hour. That's kind of the norm for all of these engines. If you're seeing a standard deviation above that, you know that there's something different happening in that motor that needs to be addressed. So what we do with Lab 1 is we're going to turn around and create a, um, an inspection or a maintenance action for you to do to find out why that was caused. And we also are going to ask you for uh, samples that are going to be at a shorter interval to basically confirm that that trend is not still occurring. Okay, so real quick, walk us through the different type of metals that are in an engine that you would see show up in an oil analysis. In other words, you see this particle, it came from what? Okay, so one of the big ones is going to be your bearings. Bearings are going to be composed of copper, lead, and tin. And the main two elements you're going to see trend there are going to be copper and lead. Problem with us with aviation is we run leaded fuel, so we are already dumping a lot of lead in there. So we're really looking for a combination of copper and tin to kind of be raising together. And that's gonna tell us that we're having excessive wear in your bearing surfaces. Uh, when you look at like the pistons, piston skirts, you're gonna see aluminum uh, and chromium. Uh, the piston rings are gonna be the chromium, the pistons themselves are gonna be the aluminum. Uh, sometimes you get a little copper if they have different alloys of aluminum. Uh, one that hap happens a lot is when guys swap oil brands. So when you're on an oil brand for a period of time, you get what's called a varnish layer that's created. And if you swap brands, the chemistry changes, and you'll get this giant spike in copper. Well, that copper comes directly from the oil cooler. So it's actually leaching out a little bit of copper from the oil cooler. So there's all kinds of these little relationships you learn over time doing this for 10, 15 years. So take us behind the scenes a little bit, not yeah. in reality, yeah. and virtually here. Okay. What do you guys do? What is the method or machinery you use to take a drop of oil and to check for all these things? Okay. So there's lots of different equipment we can use. Uh, the main instrumentation we use uh, for the wear metal analysis, long word, ready? Inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometer. Yeah, you can keep that word. Okay. We've abbreviated to ICPOES. Uh, what it, and I'm gonna break it down to an even simpler term. It's actually a argon plasma torch that we're injecting the oil into. And what that does is it burns the oil and it gives us a spectrum of light. And that light spectrum, the intensity of all of these different bands of light tells us what what elements are there and in what quantity. So you lost me there. I think it was all high tech and now you're bringing it back to like caveman or literally burning the stuff to find out what it is. Exactly. So if you remember from a high school chemistry class, your teacher put a Bunsen burner on the table, he took a copper rod and he put it through and it burned green, right? We're doing the same thing, but we're doing it on a very, very precise level. So we're able to tell the difference between one and two different parts per million of that little copper line of green light that's coming from that oil sample. This makes total sense because in Larry's day job, he actually blows stuff up. So... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I get to blow stuff up for a living. <laughs> we are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com. AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com. Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. South Mississippi Light Aircraft at FlySMLA.com. Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport at FlyFoxtrot95.com. Edge Performance at EdgePerformance.no. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at ExperimentalAircraftChannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics and so much more. All right, continue on on the... Uh... Okay, so that, that's the main thing you do to wear metals. For viscosity, uh, that's another really important metric, and that's your showing you the resistance to flow to an oil. So aviation oils are typically 40 weight, 50 weight. That's all a measure of resistance to flow against gravity. So we have these little glass tubes that we heat to, either, to 100 degrees C. You fill it with oil and you get it to that temperature and then you let it go and it has two timing marks. And it's the time it takes to flow between those marks tells you the viscosity of the oil in, in a uh, unit called senostokes. So each oil grade has a specific range of senostokes that qualifies it to be within that SAE grade of oil. So we wanna make sure that your oil still maintains that same SAE grade of oil. 
The last thing that we do for aviation samples is called oxidation. I'm going to stop you right there on, right there on the uh, viscosity thing. So is that really telling you something as an oil analysis tester, or is it just telling on the owner that they haven't changed their oil in a very long time and the viscosity is broken down? Yeah. So there's lots of things that can affect viscosity. That's why we test it. So if you're running really, 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 really rich all the time, like think about guys that are on the ground leaving it full rich and not leaning it back. What happens is you get a lot of fuel that sits on the outside of the cylinders that will drain down into the oil itself. And over time, that'll take the viscosity and it'll start to drop the viscosity down. So you lose the lubrication properties of the oil in that case. It doesn't just burn off or off gas later? No, it doesn't burn off or off gas. It takes, it's going to entrain itself into the oil and it's going to just slowly over time decrease the viscosity of the oil. Uh, the other side of that is, which I was going to get to, is oxidation. So you got guys, you know, think about a high, hot climb out, you throw the throttle forward, you're climbing out, you look at your oil temperature in 135, 140. If that's kind of your standard temperature you see in climb out, every time you do that, think of it as kind of like a ticking, uh, think of it like a fuse ticking off the usability of the oil. What you're doing is you're instituting what's called oxidation. And what that does is it causes the oil to thicken. But it also tells us that you've thermally stress the oil repeatedly for a long period of time. So we see that in a lot of cases of guys, hot, high, high performance, trying to really you know, push the limit in the climb and not allow the oil temperatures cool. We see that quite a bit. So one of the things that does show up uh, and has broken up several um, aircraft partnerships over the years from us yeah. is um, we can actually tell in the oil analysis when somebody's going extremely in a peak for a long period of time. So what it shows up in is excessive oxidation occurs and we get about a doubling of the wear metal rates per hour. So you can actually, in some of the reports, you say, hey, this guy was flying it mainly, we got this rate, and then this other guy comes in and flies it, and then we get a, you know, this whole different oil analysis wear metal rate over time. So it, it's caused some uh, contention across some owners. They call us, are you serious? <laughs> it's kind of funny. But no, we, we do see that in guys that are extreme Lena Peak guys. You guys are flying um, you know, over 75% horsepower as a constant at about 100 degrees Lena Peak. We do see a lot of these excessive wear metal rates and excessive um, uh, oxidation events occur from, from those type of operations. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks for a great explanation of behind the scenes of what happens during an oil analysis and the fact that we don't need to send filter particulate out to you as well. Yeah. But what, when is the best time for somebody to start doing an oil analysis? The answer to that is any time. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to establish your trend. So every motor is going to be slightly different. So you may, like, let's say we take an air cam. We got two Rotax 912s on there. In theory, they should be operated exactly the same. Well, and honestly, they're not. One's going to be producing a little bit no different numbers than the other. What you want to know is what is the, what are the numbers for each one of these motors and what is normal. And then what you want to detect is when it starts to go abnormal. And that's what you want to catch. It's a lot a lot less expensive to fix something when it's starting to go abnormal than it has become abnormal in the air. <laughs> so what's the process? Uh, do you have to um, order a, a, a test kit, essentially? You buy, buy a test kit and you ship it out and then they ship it back or explain the process? Okay, so for Lab 1, we do is we do everything prepaid because we don't want to have, you know, sending out invoices and harassing anybody. So we do all of our analysis in a prepaid. So. For the kits here at Oshkosh, we're, um, our normal price is twenty-two fifty. For Oshkosh, the special was we're including um, shipping uh, back to the event, back to Lab One. Uh, but yeah, you just call us up. Uh, we don't have any automated phone trees. We love talking to people. So if you guys don't like talking to phone trees, that's one thing that's nice about us. But yeah, you just uh, order them directly from us. We drop ship them to you, and then uh, when you're ready to take the sample, take the sample, throw it in the mail, and as soon as we get it back, our goal is to get it back to you within twenty-four hours. The idea is if you're out there maintaining your engine, you're doing an annual, it's better to get the information back before you put the cowling back on. Now, can you really determine something like if somebody just purchased an aircraft or the second, third, fourth, fifth owner, you know, it's mid time or whatnot, they take an oil sample, send it to you, and you find metals in it. Does that really mean anything to you yet? Or do you need to have like a minimum of three oil changes or something? So the answer to that is it depends. Okay. So uh, recently, I, I actually talked about this in my uh, spiel here at uh, the workshop. We had a guy that flew it that had a 80-hour uh, uh, overhauled motor that sat on the ramp for like 15 years. Picked it up in New York, flew it to Yuma. We did an oil sample on it, and the wear metals were high enough that it caught, that we flagged the uh, AMP on it, 
he went out, checked the lift on the uh, the lifters, and determined that all of the cam lobes had lost twenty thousandths in lift. So, just from that initial report, because the numbers were so obvious, we were able to point the mechanic to a failure mode that was actively occurring within this E225 motor. Well, obviously, Larry knows what he's talking about and working with this company here to get you guys good information. So where can they find you online or to make that phone call to talk to you? So our phone number is 866-652-2663 or find us on the web at uh, lab1inc.com. Awesome. Again, thanks for the, uh, the valuable information. Maybe we can keep these engines running a little bit longer. All right. Thank you. Thank you.